Hey, welcome everybody on our first uh, virtual 40 office session of this year. Normally we do the, uh, the session over here in our office. You see my colleagues are sitting over there. They're having a lot of fun in their office, but due to COVID, of course, we have to be separated a little bit more. Uh, before we go uh, with, uh, with the session that Peter Jan and Jetsen will give to you, first a few things about exclusive networks. Um, we are a global specialist for cybersecurity and cloud solutions. Uh, and our mission is to be the, the global distributor and to become and to make uh, uh, the cyber landscape a safer place. This is our vision and this is the way that we want to do it. We do it together with uh, a lot of uh, vendors in the portfolio, but we also add some extras on top of those vendors. Solutions uh, that we offer to the channel where partners like you or end customers can use um, to add value of our solutions uh, but why does the market need a specialist why would you go to exclusive networks instead of going to a box mover that are the same products why can we add the value on top of those solutions well we have a few solutions that we built uh, throughout the years as you probably know we are a global player so we are working for the belgian uh, division of exclusive networks but we're globally spread all over the world and that is one of our uh, value that we can offer solutions, we can offer uh, training, we can offer services uh, in the entire world. So if you have a project that is uh, situated in Belgium, but you also need some installation in another country, that are solutions that we can offer you, that are uh, stuff that we can help you with. Of course, we are uh, in Belgium the official training center. So if you need some extra training uh, for, uh, for Fortinet, we can always uh, help you and support you. You can find all those information on the website or contact us after this session to see how we can help you, how we can set up a personal training or how we can uh, get you into the official training program of Fortinet. Uh, an extra value that we offer is the managed security services. Uh, this is called MSSD and this is a solution that we add on top of Fortinet where we can take over uh, the entire management of the network and we can take over the entire security management of the network. Uh, we do this on top of uh, a Fortinet. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, webinars coming up about this solution. This is also a new solution for us. Uh, and we're pushing this into the, into the market because just placing a FortiGate somewhere at an end customer, yeah, it's nice, it's great, but you need to have more insight. What is happening? Uh, how, can we, uh, how can we add? extra security, how, will you, can you, how can you change uh, the policies, what is really, really happening inside of those uh, networks. Uh, we have two flavors on uh, top of it. We have only the monitoring and alerting, and then the other one is uh, also prevention and countermeasures. Uh, that means that we, when there is an, a breach, for instance, then we can help you to solve those breaches, to, to find countermeasures uh, uh, against those uh, attacks. Uh, viable is our financial uh, solution. Uh, when you have a, a bigger project and it's difficult for the end customer or for you to finance it, we can offer your solutions uh, for that. This can be a yearly payment, monthly payment, quarterly payment. All those stuff are, are, are possible. Just contact us in front of a project and we can see how we can help you, how we can support you uh, on those questions. And last but not least, the launch will be uh, during this month, uh, is our XOTay platform. As you all know, the market is changing. Everything is going to subscriptions. So those subscriptions um, are the new way of working. Microsoft one of the, is one of the biggest players that is using that, and all the other vendors are following uh, with that solution. Within exclusive networks, we have also built a platform where it's possible to purchase uh, Fortinet products on a subscription base. The launch will be on the 17th of this month. There will be still a lot of marketing slides coming to you. Uh, so if you have any questions about it, just contact us uh, and, and we'll see how we can, uh, we can help you with that solution. Now. After this session, there is, be, there is also an, uh, an, uh, a voting or there is be an, uh, an evaluation, sorry. There will be an evaluation uh, for everybody. It will start automatically after uh, the entire session. And uh, with the participants of today, we will uh, draw one person who will, will uh, win a voucher, 50 euros. And afterwards, everybody gets into a uh, big pot and then we will, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, do another drawing where you can win uh, AirPods or you can win um, 
iPhone. So this is after the session. I will just ask you to fill it in uh, the uh, the form, and then afterwards we will uh, contact you if you have uh, one. And right now, I would like to give the, the word to my uh, my colleagues who will uh, present today. Are for the office to you, Idrian? Yes, sir. Up to you guys. Can you add anything to that? <laughs> okay, thank you, Stefan. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's great to have you all here in our 40 office. It's a little bit different than what we are used to. And usually, this room here is crammed full of people, and then we can show all the 40 office uh, equipment and do live demos and answer on live questions. But okay, it's going to be a little bit different because of COVID, and we are trying to make the best of it. Um, I am sitting here in the office, you're seeing me. Jetsen is more than a meter and a half away from me uh, with air circulation, so everything is safe, no problems there. We have different screens to show stuff. We have a camera in front of us that can zoom in on, on the stuff we want to show you. Okay, so maybe it's a, it's a good thing if, if Jetsen zooms in on this screen and we can quickly show you what the new 40 office uh, is all about. Yep, there we go. Okay, maybe zoom in a little bit more on the topology. Okay, maybe a little bit. Okay, so, so thank you, thank you, Jetsen. Um, so, what did we build? So, the, the base setup of the 40 office for those that know it did not change. Okay, so but maybe for people who are new to the whole concept, let's explain what we did here. The goal was to um, build a, a Fortinet setup um, that represents many organizations. Okay, and we try to build an environment that is suitable for small environments. But as you see, the setup which we are going to, which we've incorporated in here and we'll cover it later, is also very suitable for very large organizations. Okay, but the first thing here is our 40 office, which consists out of two 40 gates. There's two 40 gates, 80 Fs. They're built in a high availability cluster stuff. Connected to that, we have, so that is our layer three stuff. That is our perimeter security action. Fortinet also has switches. And the switches of Fortinet, they can be configured in what we call an MC lag configuration, okay? So it's like multi-chassis uh, setup. So that is what we've set up here. So we have built this setup in two different layers. So we have tier one and we have tier two. In tier two of the Fortinet switches, we have connected the 40 access points. And that is where our clients are going to be connecting to wirelessly. And of course, the access switches, the other ports are going to be used to connect other devices using the game. But more on that later, how it's actually going to look into our security fabric setup. Now, the security fabric does not only consist out of Fortinet devices, we also have a Forti manager, analyzer, sandbox, mail, other products, of course, of Fortinet to, uh, to build a, a, a better security posture for the whole organization. Okay, so let's quickly zoom in on how this, so this is a topology on, in, in the PowerPoint, very, very clear. How does it look uh, once we have built this in our own environment? So I'll quickly share my screen. Oh, so I'm doing something wrong. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen now. If you're still seeing the video, it's, it's probably popping over, over it. Um, this is the view of the 40 gate ADF, the ones you've seen in the slides. If we've configured the full security fabric and we will explain you how we did it, this is a view you are going to get from your organization from the point of view of your user interface. And this user interface will allow you to search for objects. As you can see, we can search for host names, we can search for IP addresses, MAC addresses, um, anything, serial numbers of devices even, to pinpoint where a specific device in your organization is located and what clients are connected behind them. 
This is only possible if we build a security fabric. And the security fabric, as you can see here on the, on the bottom, it minimally consists out of 40 gates and uh, a 40 analyzer. That is where all of the information is centrally stored, and that is what we use to actually build this view. Now, on top of that, we can add other security products from Fortinet into the security fabric to get more security, to get, a, a, again, a better view of what is happening. So we have included for the sandbox, we've included for management purposes then, a for the manager, the switches, the APs. Um, uh, for a moment, you don't see 40 client, but it is integrated. Um, and the one has also been copied. Okay? And if, if a client is connecting anywhere in your organization, every few minutes, this view will update, and you will be able to locate these devices very easily. Okay, so we're going to be covering a few use cases today. Um, so today we're going to specifically zoom in on how the 40 office itself, the small environment with the ADF clusters is built, um, with switches and the access points. Jensen is going to show that. Um, included into that setup, and it's new for 406.4, we have these NAC features. And the NAC features included in the 40 gate in combination with the EMS, with tagging, gives you a lot of possibilities. Okay. But this example of NAC, because you've seen it in the, um, you've seen it in the agenda we sent, we're going to cover NAC. This is not a replacement for the 40 NAC. Okay. So the example we are going to give today about NAC is for small uh, office environments. This is for environments where a full-blown NAC solution is out of the scope because it's too complex to manage or because it has too much stuff in there which you do not really need. Uh, this is today again combination, next solution on the FortiGate built in in combination with switches, access points, and FortiGlide units. But yes, it's going to show us. So then we're also going to cover quickly how SSL VPNs can be uh, established. We try to build the, uh, the signal sign on solution. But that is probably going to be for uh, another day. Okay. Then to actually go um, a little bit further, we have also decided to, and, because, and that is a new thing. Okay. So this is how the 40 office looked like last year. But we have decided that we want to incorporate the 40 office as a branch of a larger organization. So that's the second way you can look at the setup. So instead of, a, okay, the 40 office on itself is a small environment, but if it would be a branch of a larger environment, we are talking about a data center, okay? And probably the data center is the hub for a lot of different branches. And then the question arises, how are we going to connect all of these branches to that data center? Do we need to have an MPLS? Do we have an MPLS on all the sites, in all the countries, in all the cities where our branches are located? That are questions, probably not. Can we afford these kinds of things? So there a solution could be SD1 with redundant ISPs, redundant tunnels to different data centers. Okay. And we will then definitely need, and we also have cloud solutions, SaaS, and then we will need to decide what it, how is a branch going to route its traffic to the internet? to specific SaaS applications, to applications on data center one or data center two. For that, we are going to build an SD1 logic. And as you can see, if, if we look at it from that point of view, this is a setup for a large enterprise. We can cover both things in this very same office. Uh, and everyone is, of course, free to ask any questions if, if, if there are any about something you would like us to add. The thing we haven't added yet, and which is going to come, it's, it's on the roadmap, or the office is evolving, is a full um, Office 365 um, integration. It's on the roadmap, we will have a hybrid um, de uh, domain controller and everything, but for the moment it is not there. And so how does it look like again from a topology point of view? You see here are branches with all the VPNs, and of course, because this setup includes a lot of devices. We want to go um, to a centralized management solution. And 
in my opinion, it is impossible to build a, an SD branch setup without a Forti branch. So this is um, quickly logging on to the in, into the Forti manager to show you quickly how it is looking like, and then then I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, to Yetsa, who is going to show you a little bit the the, the basic setup. Of, of the different components of the small office. This is just to give you a helicopter view of all, of all the equipments. So this is a 4D manager. We're working with add-ons. Current large enterprises are doing that. And if we go to the device manager, here you see nicely organized all of the devices that are part of the office. Okay. These are already five devices. Larger organizations have about 40, 50, 100 stores. Yeah, even thousands of sites. Okay. Uh, I will explain a little bit in how we automated everything, and then it will become very clear why for these kinds of setup in the security fabric, you also want to introduce the 4T manager. Okay, but more on that later, um, I give the word to Jetsa. It will explain a little bit on how the, the 4T office on itself as a little island is looking like. And then we'll yeah, basic so to say, in the, in the bigger picture, we're talking about the logic device. All right, so thank you, Peter Jan. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, I have to find the right button. <laughs> There we go. Yep. All right. So now you should see my screen, which is correct. Yeah. Yes, yes, we're seeing the screen. All right. So the topology we've made um, is basically um, based on the security fabric of uh, Fortinet. So um, here you can see at the top of my screen, we have the two FortiGates. Uh, it's a FortiGate cluster. You can see it's active passive. Uh, we have the left and the right FortiGate. And this is the, the um, head security fabric component of our topology. So uh, what this means is that um, this FortiGate uh, is able to push uh, settings and connections to, to the other FortiGates within the network. And what we can do with it is um, we can um, automatically add uh, other FortiGates within our network to the security fabric and they will receive um, the settings that we've set on the um, on this cluster here in our office. Um, so um, it's automatically added to the 40 manager to the analyzer, and we have complete feasibility of the network. And that's that's the main goal uh, of a security fabric to provide visibility. As you can see, we also have some um, integrations. So as PT Jan said, uh, we have the 40 manager, um, which our devices are connected to. We also connected to a 40 analyzer, which is used for logging and uh, to have an in-depth view of what is happening on our network. We are integrated with a 40 sandbox, which is um, here on-prem. Um, and which is used um, by the FortiGate to uh, sandbox um, files that it sees on the network. It's also used by the 40 mail devices, which will come in the future. Um, and these mail devices will use these, uh, this sandbox to um, test the attachment in emails. And it's also added to um, the 40 client EMS server. <clears throat> Sorry, and um, the 40 clients itself. So this means that if um, a file is unknown 
on a device and 40 clients is installed and it's managed by our EMS server, um, these clients can also send the files to our 40 sandbox. And so, as I've said, we also have the 40 client EMS server. Now, um, to give you a view of what we've configured here, um, maybe Pete Jan can tell some more. You see that um, here we have some remote devices popping up in our topology. And this is because we've um, set up an SD1 environment between this hub here at our office and some other locations. Um, they're hosted in Azure, but they can be anywhere in the world. And this is basically um, what PTM will talk about. Um, yeah, we'll, moment. we'll keep that a little bit separated. So I think it's good to move into the what the 40 office is, and then I will zoom out and talk about the world, okay? Um, step by step. Yeah. Yeah, oh, all right. <clears throat> so the 40 office, um, what we have here, so uh, PTM has shown the, the 40 manager, which is used to manage um, the devices. Uh, here we have um, complete um, administrative control of how the policies are managed here. So, um, you can see the policies on our device. Maybe it's easier if I show it on, on the device itself. Yeah, I'll cover the map. Yeah. So, so we have um, some policies, um, and I will um, use the policies to, to explain the, the components. So, first of all, we have our um, Wi Fi um, policy. And this is configured uh, from the FortiGate itself. So if we go to our managed APs, we see we have two APs included. Um, we've linked it to the FortiGate, and FortiGate will automatically connect with them. And all the settings will be pushed from the FortiGate to the APs. So this means that you have an overview, central management, and it's really easy to use. Um, for example, we've created an SSID. It's easy. Uh, we've created the 40 Office Wi-Fi, and it's automatically pushed to the APs. So, and, and an interesting thing to note here for very, very small environments, this is ideal, and you would manage it from the 40 gate. Um, but if you have a large enterprise with many branches, then the idea, of course, would be to go and manage the um, the access points also from in the 40 manager. We are not going to cover that, but I just want to give you that. Uh, then it's ideal to configure all of the SSIDs there and then push it to multiple sites um, at once. Okay. The before the access points uh, from Fortinet managed by the FortiGate, they are not ideal for very large environments. Okay. So if you if you're going to be with 50 or 100 access points, um, it's not that is not the uh, the sweet spot. But for, but for distributed environments with relatively small branches, a multitude of them, or a single small office, it is it is the perfect solution. And of course, also in combination with the with the switches, with the managed switches. But yes, it is going to cover that. Yeah. Also, a feature that I would like to share with you is the the AP profile. So. Um, as I said, it's easy to, to integrate the APs with the FortiGate, and uh, you can even specify some profiles um, that will be automatically applied to new um, APs. So um, this is really easy. You can just plug it in in the network, and the AP will work. The settings are automatically pushed. There is no... Um, no administrative things that you uh, still need to do. So it's it's really handy. You can see there are a lot of um, settings that you can specify in such profile, which uh, channels it need to use, um, the the power. Um, you can also configure it to automatically uh, do the power control. So it's it's really easy to to. 
uh, deploy um, APs in this network. And the same goes for, for the 40 switches. So um, if we go to the, the managed 40 switches, you can see our four managed switches. Um, here you can see the MCLAC peer group. It's um, basically uh, an, a, a cluster of switches. And um, you can also see which connections are, are active at the moment and which aren't. So you can see here the 40 gate left, which is the primary device, um, is now connected to the tier one, two switch. And this one um, is connected to our access layer and um, is handling all the traffic. If this one goes down, then of course, uh, via the links, you will see that it's handed over to T11. So uh, the interesting thing to note here is that um, we have all of these cross connections, so it's fully fully redundant, fully meshed setup. That also means that yeah, actually uh, probably the, the setup for a small office is a little bit overkill here, but this is just to show you what you can do. Okay. Uh, probably this setup makes more sense when you go to like a mid enterprise with a few hundred people behind the 40 gates, and then there's also uh, link aggregation connections from the 40 gate to these switches. And we can even extend this solution into um, into a data center. Okay, there. So and that is the interesting part about Fortinet. Um, as you can see, we uh, we Fortinet we we have solutions for small uh, environments, but we can extend that to data center solutions. Um, even internet, internet service providers. Okay. So, if you have a question about a specific feature, and if you think it doesn't make sense, maybe in your use case, come and talk with us because it is very well possible that Fortinet has a solution, a little bit a different solution that suits your needs. The time is too short to cover all of the different options in this part of the office session, and for us now, it's not really the goal to. Uh, to focus on, on, on data center solutions and on service provider solutions. But yeah, just for your information, know that we can do almost everything. But yeah, uh, it's interesting. But not all features make sense in every use case. Yes, it's laughable. <laughs> yeah, and so um, as I said, the same uh, goes for 40 switches. So this includes the management. VLANs will automatically be populated to new um, switches that you introduce in your network. Um, you even have the, the uh, central overview of the ports uh, from our switches, which are um, set to which um, VLANs. And a cool feature that uh, PTM um, talked about in the introduction is the, the NAC policies that we can now apply to our 40 switches. So um, for example, it's a, it's a bit of a stupid example, but if the operating system is a Windows, then you will automatically be enrolled in the corporate resources VLAN, the corporate VLAN. And um, based on that, you can apply uh, policies from the corporate VLAN to, to other resources within your network. And so the, the next feature um, is, is an easy way of including NEC in basic topologies and um, to, to uh, do some access control within the physical topology. And you see you have some different um, matching criteria that you can use, for example, the, the user group which the, with the um, which is logged on on the device. We can even include EMS tags. So as I said, with the 40 client EMS server, we can manage uh, 40 clients, and then we can include some tags, and based on this tag, we can automatically put the device into a specific VLAN. And the same goes with the device um, specificities like MAC address, hardware vendor, etc. Yeah, an interesting thing to note here, if, you, if the category is device, there is the, um, the limitation that the client needs to be um, behind the 40 gate. 
because the Forte gate needs to, yeah, needs to be a layer two connection in order to work with MAC addresses. Um, and for the other detections, it's probably also necessary that the client is directly in the same network in order for the Forte gate to learn that. Now, another thing, as yet told us, where we can look at is user information, but yeah, that's not very new. The very new thing is like the EMS tags, and it's really cool because there we are actually going to communicate with the the endpoint management server of Fortinet, okay, and that is the management server where the Forti clients are reporting to and also receiving their configurations from. Now, the amount of information we can gather from there is is, is immense, okay, um, and it allows us to a, apply what what Fortinet calls and, and also in the configuration of our the Forti client is some kind some kind of zero trust setup. We, and Jesse is going to show that in, in a few moments, um, we are able to look um, at so many more things than what we are just able to discover from a network point. We can look at processes that are started. We can look at um, certificates that are installed or not installed, files that are on a system, um, et cetera, et cetera. And if any of the of these parameters that we are going to be looking at is on the system, yes or no, we can assign to that system what we call a tag. And maybe yes, I should open the tagging thing again. So yeah. if, you, if you open that drop, drop down, you see like, uh, you see Mac, blah, blah. So that are the Mac addresses of devices from company owned devices that are, that are default for the client EMS tags that are in there, like high and low and medium risks. But at the bottom, you see like two interesting tags. And, and it's again, it's a, it's a basic example, but yeah, uh, the one on top. So it's tag underscore um, calculator. <laughs> this means like if calculator, calculator process is running on the system, it's like give it a tag. And then based on that, we can decide, well, put that user in a different uh, VLAN, yes or no. It's just a basic example, but it gives you the, an idea of how powerful this, this feature can be. This is fully dynamic uh, based on, and that's also very important to note, based on what a client is seeing from the endpoint. And as we all know, what a client is seeing on the endpoint is the most accurate information we can have. Visibility on the network is always reduced and because of one simple thing, a lot of the traffic is SSL encrypted, there might be different hops, but the client is seeing on the client, yeah, the truth, uh, everything that is there. So I'll, I'll give the word back on uh, to Jensen. Yeah, maybe I can uh, just proceed with the EMS server. So you can really see how these tags are created. Uh, let's log in. There we go. So the EMS server is a central management server for, for 40 clients. And basic, basically what it does is it um, pushes profiles and settings to the, the 40 clients on the devices that are installed. So um, we can apply tags, as Peter Jan said, um, for almost anything. Um, here you can see the, so the, this is the name that's not important. But here you can uh, just type in a name, test tag, and then we can add a rule. The rules can be um, for Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, and Android devices are supported. And um, you have several different options. So um, as Peter Jan said, you can uh, trigger on is a uh, uh, process running, but you can also see here, is there antivirus software installed? Um, which domain is it locked in, um, registry keys, the OS version. So you have several different options to, to create these tags and add them to, to your endpoints. Uh, same goes for Mac um, and Linux, and even, uh, as I said, mobile devices are supported. So you can see, uh, you can tag uh, mobile devices on the user identity or the IP range, which uh, they are um, using and with Android, the same thing. And um, 
basically if you've done that then the tag will be um, added to the endpoint and will be pushed to the FortiGate and the FortiGate can use these tags to 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 manage them and to to apply policies or, or to to um, push them in a separate VLAN, whatever you want. Uh, another cool feature of the EMS server are the profiles. So here you can decide which um, features are enabled on the 40 clients. So um, as you may know, there is a mal malware protection feature, but also sandboxing included in the 40 client web filtering, firewalling, and um, some that I can show you now, uh, the VPN future, um, which you can use to automatically um, push uh, several VPN tunnels to the client, and users will automatically have um, the option to, to log in onto the VPN or to even uh, pre-log on, so before they even log into their computer, um, enable the VPN and um, have direct access to company resources. So this is something uh, you can easily do with the, the 40 client EMS. Uh, you can see here there are also vulnerabil vulnerability scanning features. Um, is a system patched? Um, you can even um, do the maintenance and um, schedule automatic patching. So it's it's really a handy um, component uh, to manage your endpoints. So yeah, and this and this is uh, this is a really important feature for now everybody who's working from home, okay? Because uh, well. As a Dell VPN and an even IP6 VPN, you can choose one or one of both. And it's been in the 40 client for, for many, many years. Okay. But the combination with the 40 client being able to see what kind of applications are running on the system and their yeah, whether they're vulnerable, yes or no, based on the common vulnerability and exposures database, the CVEs. Um, we have seen, and maybe you didn't see it, but I'll, I'll tell you now. In the zero trust settings, we can use that information again to tag our device. Okay, we can use all of that information we have about the client to decide whether we want that client to be able to connect to our company's resources, yes and no. And that is especially it has always been very important, especially now that everybody is behind the perimeter, well, at home, wherever they're not working from in the office anymore, it's not allowed. Um, and that is sometimes a big problem to, to keep F, uh, to keep that control of, over these devices. Um, but the combination with the Ferti client managed by the EMS, with the with the single sign-on settings, with the security posture, the zero trust settings that we can configure, and then also with the ability to extend the web filtering and application control features to the Ferti client itself. It's, there is almost no more difference whether the client is working in the office or at home. And that is, yeah, I believe for many organizations, it has been in the first months of COVID, it has been a huge challenge. And probably for uh, many of those, it's, 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 still a, it's still a challenge to be tackled. Okay? How to keep it, uh, have that, having that visibility on all of these clients and also not only visibility, but, <clears throat> but also control. But yeah, first need to have the visibility before you can start controlling these, uh, these things. All right, and so um, maybe I can show you the some of the features that are now pushed. So I have a device, a laptop, which is um, connected to the EMS server. Um, I don't know if you can see it or not. Maybe I have to zoom in. Uh, Yeah, that's a bit better, I guess. So it's really small, but here you can see um, my laptop. So, um, no, I, I don't think you can see it, but um, these are all the profiles that we have enabled in the MS profile and which are automatically pushed to the uh, 40 client once you connect it 
to the uh, centrally managed EMS server. So you have here the malware protection profiles, which is uh, which is enabled. Sandbox detection, which um, enables the fourth client to automatically uh, send malicious or suspected malicious files to the sandbox. Uh, we have the application firewall, and we also have the remote access. So as you can see, the VPN um, tunnels are automatically pushed. So the only thing you have to do is you have to um, put in your username and password. As I said, this can also be done uh, pre-logon, so before you log on on the device. And then you can even um, use your uh, Microsoft credentials for it. And then uh, VPN will automatically be set up and you're good to go, uh, ready to work from home um, as PJR sets uh, without any disturbance. So it's it's really easy to, to manage, it's really easy to deploy, and it gives you so much more uh, features that you can um, enable within your network. And that's, yeah, I think it's really cool thing, the, the EMS server. So, um, as it's itself, VPN, it's, it's nothing new, but we, we wanted to show how be completely honest here. We want to show you the the, the pre-logon feature, um, but as you can, I'm, I don't know if you noticed, um, but yeah, our certificates are not yet in order in the for the office. We still have to register a domain, get the uh, certificates, okay, um, and that is really a key thing. Make sure that on that level everything is alright because the fourth client is complaining about the certificate and he doesn't want to make a connection. So if you do it properly. There, there is no problem. And I mean, the, the signal I just sign on before log on to the Windows machine, um, yeah, makes it so that it, if you log, if, if a user logs on, and especially now with the COVID situation, and again from home, the, the host needs to connect to the domain controller once in a while, otherwise it gets like disconnected and and funky things start to happen on on the Kerberos level. So we definitely don't want to have that. Secondly. Um, what also is a problem is like these scripts that needs to run pre-log on, they're not working because very often they, they're reaching out to internal resources to get, uh, to go to file shares, to run scripts, etc., etc. So for that reason, it's really, really interesting to have that single sign-on feature. So we are logged on actually before the user is logged on to your system. And then all of these scripts can run, Kerberos can do its stuff, and it's, yeah. Microsoft uh, stays like a, how should I call it, like a happy domain. Domain control is not happy anymore. Things start to uh, start to peak. That's that's how it is, unfortunately. All right, I think I've covered most of the security fabric uh, connections um, within our uh, forty gate. So uh, maybe I can uh, hand it back to Peter Jan and. Yes, we can yes, yes, yes. go over the 40 manager and the tunneling stuff. Yes, I, I will. I will go into that in a second. Just here, my Okay, I need to make myself. Yeah. So I'll show you. Okay, so yeah, this is for later, and I just started the calculator. Probably should be able to see that. It's not so important. So thank you, Getsa, for showing all the components we've seen now. So where are we now? What, what did we see? Um, we did not see the branches. Talk about those later with the Forty Manager. Uh, we have the for the office with two forty gates cluster devices. We have our different tiers of our access layer, the switches connect to the access points and the clients. So we see all of that, all of that visibility. Now what we didn't show is that like all of these actions you can take on these devices. We can drill down to get more details about the device. We can even go in there and say, well, there is something happening, something fun funky is going on with this user, or you get alerts in the SOC. You can decide from here to actually go and guarantee the host. Again, with the search feature, 
this is a small setup, but if you want to look for people, um, yeah, ask yourself the question, how easy can you, even in an office environment without the whole COVID thing, how easy can you find where a user is connected? If you see an alert in the, for the analyzer, for example, how easily are you going to find it? It's very hard, but with this feature, it's so much easier. Okay, But then the question arises, hmm, we have a 4D analyzer. All the logs are in there. That's what is building this view. But the 4D analyzer can see if something is going on, right? Is there a way to automate this? Is there a way that we can automatically go and guarantee hosts or put them in another VLAN, for example? That's basically the same thing. So the answer is yes, of course. And we all of that can be leveraged through the uh, again the security fabric. And for that, we should go and zoom into this little feature here, the automation feature. So the automated automation feature when we're Looking at it from perspective of the security fabric is being um, managed by the root 40 gate. In our case, it is the 40 gate idea. So, if some people are not, are they like the root 40 gate? What is it? It's not, it is really important when you go and configure this thing, but it's not so important to understand how all of this is working. Okay, it's just the thing that is managing this automation. That's it. So, we see in this automation. Um, a lot of, of pre-built things like, okay, if and if there is a compromised host, and this is information we receive from a 40 analyzer, then what are we going to do? Well, we want to do something on all 40 gates, or we want to do something, we could actually change this thing. You could actually say like, I only want to do something on one of the 40 gates. So that's, that's up to you. This is something that the, the security fabric is going to manage for you, but yeah, that's the action. So we're going to do something on all of the 40 gates if there is compromised host. Um, and in our scenario, we will say, well, we want to do a quarantine on the access layer. So what is the access layer? Access layer is layer two. So there we're talking about MAC addresses. So at that moment, what is going to happen? 40 client with, with its IOC features, is seeing that something funky is going on in one of the clients because why? How does it know it? Because it's receiving logs. It's receiving logs from the 40 gate. It's receiving also logs from the 40 client. So we can even do something when these people are at home in their home office where God knows what is going on. Okay? So if we would decide to do an access layer quarantine on our switches and our access points, well, this is going to work in the office, but it's not going to work in the home office. So that is why we can choose to have another accent. We contain that client from a 40 client perspective. Why not? At that moment, it doesn't matter where the client is, in the home office, in the office, uh, wherever. Okay? In the branch side uh, that isn't connected to the security fabric behind the switch, which is uh, a non fortinet switch it's possible okay it's rare but it's possible i'm just joking so then we can, we can do this action and and as you can see there are tons of other actions we can take we could run a cli script we could send an email we could decide to send a notification to the 4d explorer app it's an app that can be installed on your phone it's an iphone app or ipad app so if something is going up in, uh, on in your organization, you will get a push notification. Ping, something has happened. There is a compromised host. We did something. Now, I'm, and, and then the whole discussion can start. Yeah, but what's false positive? And should we block it? Blah, blah, blah. Well, this is something you have to think about. Maybe you only want to have a notification and then go up and look at it manually. Or you can say, well, I get a notification. I do an automated action, and then we will that's, that depends on organization per organization. The question is there, or do we have a SOC team, etc., etc., etc. So depending on the size and depending on the type of clients, there can be different options here. So that is the whole idea. So this is the real power of the security fabric. All of these components are logging stuff on-premise, off-premise, in the data center, it doesn't matter, but the analyzer has a communication channel with the 40 gate, and we can trigger these things automatically. So we're quickly going to show that um, 
Yeah, I'm gonna maybe go over the other things and then quickly show this compromised hosting. It's, 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 it's interesting. So we, this is a specific thing, but we can also look at for the OS event logs. If we have no um, variety analyzer, we could look at the event logs from our Forti gate itself. If something is happening, in this case, Forti analyzer collection is down. Well, maybe we want to know this, okay? We can send the Forti Explorer notification. Now, this is for a for an organization with no sophisticated tools. It's really easy. I install this app on my phone, ping, something happens, I see it, I do something. If you have a team on the other hand, okay, um, that is working in like support, center of your organization, or the SOC, they have these other tools, they have a support ticketing system. Okay? Maybe that ticketing system accepts emails, so that we enable emails. Maybe that system has an API, hopefully a REST API, and then we can send webhooks. Okay, that's a standardized way of sending information to the systems using plain HTTP, HTTPS, post could get patched to lead messages. Okay, so if you don't know what it is, it's just a REST API connection that allows you to share information between different solutions that support that language. Okay, REST API in this case typically used by the larger enterprises. But again, I, I want to show you all of these possibilities where in a small environment, a big environment, all the tools are there, depending again on, on where you are and, and how your processes work, the, a different option will be chosen. So it's highly customizable. Um, of course, you want to do something when there is a failover of high availability. Um, we can also listen for incoming webhooks. So the FortiGate also has a REST API. That means um, that we do not only support automation uh, triggers from the Fortinet product family. We can also integrate and receive, inform receive and send information actually to third party products that have an open API. And that is really, really interesting. Okay, so I, I don't know if there is any question about that, but the, I believe that this is a really, really powerful feature. This is this is actually going from having full visibility on what is going on in the whole organization, parameter, client, access layer, to being able to automate a response to what we are seeing. That is key. Being able, if you see something happening, being able, being able to respond as fast as possible. Okay. So quickly go into the for the analyzer. Um, yeah, maybe uh, for the analyzer. So this is the whole brain. This is where all the information comes together and it's, and it's crunching the information. Um, we have like, to quickly go over some, some basic features. Of course, we are ingesting all of the logs, okay? But this is like the plenty, plenty of logs from all of our systems, okay? From all, all of these devices are sending logs into the 40 analyzer. Now, the log view is ideal for doing some basic searches, but it's it's not going to give you an idea about a specific flow through the organization, like what is a top application, what are the most common types, categories of websites being visited. And typically, these are the questions you are asking yourself when you want to look at the organization as a whole. Okay, if you're looking for something very specific, yeah, this might be a good point to go and look at the log view, but probably you will be more uh, doing stuff, uh, doing more stuff in the 40 view. Because this is like um, bringing together like, okay, information about threats, um, or do we have compromised hosts? So at this moment, we do not have any compromised hosts, but maybe if, if Yetzer wants to go to, um, I send him a special link, so I'll go to the special yeah. link. And you will see something is, is going to happen. Okay, we'll come, to, we'll come back to that later. We can then go and again look at our traffic logs, but not just like the traffic logs of our systems, like going from uh, a source IP to destination IP on specific ports and then with the enrichment of, of all the applications. No, we are going to look at this information from a point of view of the sources, like what are our top sources? Okay. 
and then we we see okay this is like a very busy source and we can we can actually get more uh, we don't have any endpoint information now but you can actually zoom in more on that source and it's, and it's building a filter on the go like okay this source IP uh, what applications is it using can drill down and down and down and get more details about these sources. It's always a good starting point to have, have the top uh, sources, of course. Um, top source addresses, top destinations, top destination addresses. But then th this is just from a traffic point of view. But what about security? Do you want to know in your organization what, are, what the top applications are? And you could think like, yeah, what does this have to do with security? Well, it is really important to know what kind of applications are being used. The amount of SSL inspected traffic, for example, maybe you could think that YouTube streaming is, is no security issue. Well, it could very well be. If everybody is streaming data and your business critical applications do not work anymore because of that, that's an availability problem. And availability, that's, that's what it's all about, availability of the resources of the organizations. That's why we apply security, that we want to protect that availability. So it's really important to get all of that uh, visibility. Applications are in two different kinds. We have also cloud applications, so a nice split is going to be made here. Okay. We are, um, so I'm going over this really quickly. Uh, we have limited time. Probably, I don't know if the webinar is going to last two hours, maybe, could be. But for each of these topics, there is probably a dedicated session we can make and zoom in on it in detail. So this is the first session of the party Office 2.0, so I'll keep it a little bit general and then we will make sub-sessions on, 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 on the different things we are showing, more, more in-depth, more technical, and also know that if you are a customer or a partner that's doing installs with customers and you have a specific use case, you can go and talk with us and we, we can give a private demo of, of anything you wish. Okay, we can have like a discussion on what makes sense for you, what doesn't make sense for you, how could a solution of Fortinet uh, look like integrated in your current uh, scenario, etc. Uh, etc. Et so I think you get the idea of, of, of what this is doing uh, and why it is so powerful. I'm not sure. Nothing seems to be happening. Hmm. I got a notification that the URL was blocked by the 40 client. I downloaded a malware file and uh, I got a notification that it was sent to the sandbox and it was determined malicious. Okay. Can you show it somewhere? I can, yeah, it's a little bit difficult with the, maybe if I put it here. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> very small. Yeah, it's always, there's so many screens, so many things yeah. going on. So here you can see the block page, um, and here we, uh, I clicked it away, the notification, oh, there. oh, here it is. So here we have the notification that it was sent to the sandbox. Um, the file was blocked. Nothing. No, I'm. I'm. I, I don't know if you're seeing my screen, but I. I, I quickly went to the. Um, to the endpoints, and yeah, for whatever reason, the link I gave gets. It's. It's, it's always a little bit challenging. Something. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that there is currently a security risk. Okay, on on, on its machine. So okay, it didn't contain it automatically. Maybe maybe it's still going to happen. Could be a little yeah maybe because the file was blocked on my endpoint and it was not executed WF link? yeah the wf link um 
I just got a URL is blocked by 40 clients. So maybe because it was already blocked by the 40 clients. I think that's it. Okay, moving on. Um, so this is a use case, unfortunately, it didn't work right now. Um, works, believe me. Um, this is this specific use case about the IOC detection in the for the analyzer. And basically what it does in the case of compromise detection is like, imagine clients going to the internet and being infected by a new bomb. Okay. It is very well possible at that moment it's like something zero day, like it's never been seen before, it's something new, so we are not able to protect immediately. Nobody is. Okay, it's not a fourth thing, it's like how the security works. Um, so well, what for the analyzer is doing so after a few days or hours, the security community knows okay, this is a new botnet, that that are the URLs or domains connected to it, these are IP addresses. Basically, these are the uh, indicators of compromise that it's an indication if a client is going to that resource that it is infected. But the IOC feature in the analyzer is going to go back in time. It's going to go back seven days in time to verify, well, okay, I have that information now, but maybe while it was already running the whole thing, somebody made a connection a few days ago. That is basically what is going to be popping up. Now that's a built-in thing. We can, and that's a new feature, if we go and look at 40 Analyzer, there is something new. It's like what we call the 40 SOC. Okay. So it's Security Operations Center. It's a new license, and there is definitely going to be a full session on how the 40 SOC is working. But what is the ID? So we have all of these um, events or logs actually, we have logs coming into the 40 analyzer. We have seen that consolidated view with the 40 view. Well, we can create events out of that, okay? So we see there is like a whole bunch of events, things going on um, into the, into our organization, okay? But events can be for information only, or there are events that we actually want to send an alert to something. That has always been into the 40 analyzer, going from an event to an email alert or an SMP alert. But a very new thing is like a customized automation. Okay, it means an event is triggered. Well, maybe we now uh, want to generate a report at that moment, and we also want to send that report into that email that was being generated. Previously, that was not possible. That would have been a manual action. Maybe you also want to um, touch the endpoint and get more information about current processes running. Okay. This, this is now possible, and we attach that information into that specific report, so we have more visibility in what is at that moment happening on the system. So how do we do that? So what is new? So in this whole 40 SOC thing, we are working with connectors. And these connectors, they connect to the 40, 40 OS um, and like different other uh, systems in our organization. Also, uh, an EMS, for example, it's currently not configured. And then all of these ifs and thens and what we can do and which information that is being described in what we call a playbook. Okay. So here we have a very very basic playbook, which is basically saying, well, I'll start it. Uh, this is send a webhook to 40 OS to um, quarantine a MAC address or on an EMS point of view, an endpoint management system, quarantine a specific 40 client. Something we can do. But these playbooks, they can be a lot more complex. For example, compromised host incident. There is an event trigger, so we have logs. We can create event triggers for a specific event, meaning if we see specific logs, or one item of them, or reoccurring within a specific time frame, it can be very complex. Start a trigger, start this playbook, okay? And then it's like, okay, we want to gather information. We want to attach the specific data to an incident, and that's also something new. Uh, an incident is like uh, a collection of information which is being 
also put into the Fakti analyzer where multiple people can work on. Okay? An incident is something that an engineer is going to act on and is, it's like a working document of an event that has been triggered. But that working document needs, yeah, you can, while well, going through an investigation, add information. Now, a lot of that adding of information can be automated. That is what is happening in this, in this play. And then finally, also run, run a report that again can be uh, attached to it. Now, interestingly, for uh, depending on your organization, you already have a tool that is doing incident handling for you. Maybe you do that in your support. It's possible. Well, at that moment, we could create a playbook item that is going to send the right information using a webhook to that tool of choice. As you can see, building these, and these are building blocks, we can add more building blocks and share information, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So definitely, this is something which is going to come a, a, a whole session of about an hour on how to create playbooks, integrate with uh, third-party systems using webhooks, etc. Et now, you have to know that this is a separate license on the 4 analyzer. The good thing is if you take the 4 Analyzer VM S license, the service license, everything is included and you will also have the 4 uh, server. I'm not sure if we saw uh, an incident. Uh, no, sorry. No compromised host, okay. It is, it is what it is. Um, I'll trigger it manually. So yes, it can show what it is doing. We go cheating a little bit. I'm quickly going to check if there is any questions. No, nobody has questions. Okay. So ah. Seems to be guaranteed. I see. Do you think you that yet? Uh, I'm going to check. And yeah, this no. might be all the information in there. No guaranteed. Yeah. Ah. It's not always. Seeing it. Yeah, just what I wanted to say, it is possible to just right click a device that wants to come on browser work with me. And ban the IP in this case, or if it, if there is a party client, it's loading a little bit slowly now. I, I don't know, really don't know why. Uh, you can manually guarantee a system, but ideally this is, this is happening uh, automatically. Good. I think we have covered the the basic setup of the for the office, well, the, the small office, and uh, let's take this office. And multiply it by the amount of branches we um, we have in our uh, organization. In and in my case, I decided to actually we we have like I don't know uh, three branches. Yeah. Maybe Yitzhak can show on the screen here a quick apology of what has been built. Uh, yeah, there we go. I'm going to zoom in a bit. Zoom out a bit. So the yeah. Just configuring a small office, it's very easy. We have these forty gates, we put them in a cluster, we add the access points, we add the uh, switches and then an EMS, and it can even be in the cloud. There's so many possibilities. It's really easy to set up, okay? Uh, it's just like the most challenging thing very often is like, yeah, what does the customer want? What, what use case does? And, and every office will have a different use case. So 
define them beforehand, and then we can build this kind of setup really, really fast. Now, if you take that office and make it a branch, and, and it means that like you have like yeah, tens or hundreds of these different offices, there are other challenges, okay? It means that you probably have a, a data center or an HQ, whatever you want to call it, but there is probably a central point where information is coming together with your databases, your P systems, uh, voice uh, servers, whatnot. Okay. So these branches will need to be able to communicate at least with your headquarters, and maybe for certain features like voice, might want to communicate directly. Now, the ideal setup, of course, for that is a what we call a fully mesh setup, but that is horrible to configure manually. Okay, so actually, all of this is horrible to configure manually. The only good option here in this scenario is to introduce what we call the 14 manager. Okay, with the basic setup we've shown, we can discuss whether it's a good idea or whether you need it. But I can tell you for sure, if you want to build this, you need to have a 40 manager. There is no way around it. Okay. And it has a lot of benefits because we will build a setup for all sites that is very similar. And if there is a dissimilarity, we can fix that. There are little tricks for that. And then we will also define the way all of these sites will communicate with each other. And it can be completely managed using VPN tunnels or a mix of VPN tunnels, existing uh, MPLS lines, and traffic that is just going not through a tunnel, but to a SaaS application existing on the internet. Okay, And maybe for some SaaS applications, you want to decide that the traffic is not going directly to the internet, but is taking a loop over the data center because you want to apply extra security there. All these possibilities we can achieve with the setup I'm going to show you in combination with a 40 manager, the VPN management module in the 40 manager, in combination with a setup that allows you to start from a hub and spoke setup, meaning that we have the hub, the data center, and the spokes building, preferably in our case, we did it, redundant tunnels. But if they communicate directly with each other, that they create dynamic tunnels. So that is auto discovery VPN. That's all put in this setup. The only thing you have to do to add a site is to onboard a device, run a few scripts, fully automated, and a new site is added to this, well, complex uh, environment. So we can actually, if it's done properly, um, very easily add other branches to a very large environment. And these branches, they will have all of the features that we have shown you uh, in our 40 office. Okay. Here we go. Again, what, what is really important here is preparation, okay? You need to, uh, well, you will see, it needs to be organized. Somebody really needs to think about this and then put it in, in place. The first thing we're, we're, we're getting at is like we have a device manager, okay? So we've added all of our devices and as you can see, all of my devices are probably coffee. Okay? But what are the different uh, parts of my configuration. The first thing is we want to have connectivity between the sites. Okay, you want to build the uh, the flows, the basic flows. Like traffic needs to be flowing from branch A to branch B, C to the data center, or whatever. So that's the first thing you are going to be building, and that is what brings us to from the device manager to the VPN manager. So the VPN manager allows you to build what we call VPN communities. And I have two communities, like I have an internet community and an MPLS community, but that could be like, basically this means like every site has two internet service provider connections for redundancy purposes, and built on these connections, there are different tunnels, okay? So let's look at the first one, internet one connection. 
the if you look at the configuration there, um, let me show you this. This is the this is the phase one configuration. But, and if it doesn't tell you anything, this is how this IPsec is going to be set up. And a key thing where it's going wrong with IPsec connections and what is making it very hard is not the protocol itself. It's just because yeah, it's really sensitive. So if you make a, if the configuration on one side is different as on the other side, they won't yeah, build security associations. It's not working. They do not agree. Not and yeah, security is about authorization. So if two parties do not agree, well, no connections are going to be. But that's all made very easy in these communities. So once we have these communities, we are going to add devices. And these devices have two distinct roles. They can be either spokes or they can be either hubs. I've even complicated things even more here. I'm a very large enterprise. I have two hubs. I have two data centers. And then the discussion is, are they an exact copy of each other? Or is one resource running one data center, another data center? For all of these scenarios, we we will see we can make different rules in order to make that work specifically for any organization. So what, what does the spoke have? It's like a protected subnets. It's like here it's like very open. Uh, what is the VPN interface? And this interface is a dynamic interface. It's translated to different machines, so it doesn't necessarily need to be port one of all the machines. It's, it's a translation thing. Um, and that's it. I'm not going to go in, in, in the details of, of this because it's not complex the way I show it here once it's all set up. But to yeah, get here, um, you need you need some knowledge. You need to know how it works. Um, and then of course we have the hubs, and I've I've assigned a few hubs as well. So at the end of the exercise, if all of this is working, we just push the configuration. We will just see like on the monitor all of these tunnels. Okay, this is this is being built all automatically. The only thing I had to do was add a new site to these two communities with their specific role, spoke being a branch, push the configuration, and four tunnels will be established for that client. Why four? We have two data centers. Every site has two ISP connections for redundancy. So that's two connections to data center one and two connections to data center two. Okay. So that is in a matter of a few minutes that I managed to configure that for a new site. Okay, very, very easy. And the next step, of course, is to make sure that from a policy and object point of view, um, there is that is very easy to manage. So here is the goal for all of the branches at least for a few subsets of branches, you should strive to make a common firewall policy base from certain inputs, so from certain networks to other networks. And that allows us, if I push this configuration, to install this not on a single device, but on multiple devices at the same time. Okay. And then you go through an install wizard. It's always a good thing, and it's going to show you um, and in this case, no comments need to be installed. But if, if change needs to be installed, you get a you can also get a preview. You have, and that's another benefit of the Forti Manager. It's a big difference with the Forti Gate. In the Forti Gate, you make a change, you do okay, and it's applied. In the Manager, you make a change, you check the preview, and then you push it through. So there is a lot more control. So we've done all of that. Um, that means we have a branch with the policies, with specific settings. Um, there is a little trick you need to do from a scripting point of view. Um, oops, copy the templates, it's here. So because, yeah, the auto discovery VPN requires some very specific settings. It requires uh, PGP routing and all of that stuff, so we are also going to run scripts. Now, the information there is coming from variables. Okay, Every site has their unique um, IP addresses usually. Also, from a BGP point of view, you need to have a unique router ID. Um, but we, we actually get that information from um, variables that are assigned on a per-device level. Uh, 
Uh, again, that can be scripted, can be done really easy. Um, and that means I have only like two script packages, one for the hubs, one for the spokes. When I add a new branch and variables are set correctly, I just push that uh, script and the whole configuration is there. Okay? It's like magic. Um, so the result of that is really interesting. Okay, like if you quickly go and look at, um, at one of the branches, okay? So after we have pushed this, BGP is going to be responsible for announcing to all of the branches and the hubs um, what VPN tunnel is sourcing uh, what IP ranges, okay? And we have chosen, in our case, to have four redundant paths. We have four VPN tunnels, remember? Two to one uh, DC1 and two to DC2. This is also to have we do not only have disaster recovery on an ISP level, we also have it on a data center. But then the question is, of course, which of these routes are going to be chosen? The routing table is huge, and if you see like 10220 slash 24, we have actually four different routes, and it's all managed by PGP. And the cool thing here is like, and, and, yeah, it will be doing load balancing unless we are going to configure another feature, and that is SD1. And SD1 is then going to decide, based on the quality of the links, which of these four links is going to be chosen to a given destination. I, I just want to give you this information. This is for the setup we've built now, three sites. These are the amount of routes that, that are being generated dynamically. Okay. There is no way on earth that you want to configure this setup with static routing. It's impossible. Okay. It's, well, it is possible, but it's it's going to be horrible. So if you do it properly, it looks like this, and, and that is amazing. We have all of these paths available to make a connection. I quickly go to the forwarding manager again. So how do we make this work properly? As the one. Um, typically, SD1 is going to be used from a 4D manager because you probably have multiple or multiple sites. So we create different components here. We have an health check server. Uh, I use a little trick here, but that's an IP on the DCs that's going to be pinged, and it's always the same IP. We add interface members. In this case, we chose to only add the VPN interfaces, but uh, very often also the, the the, the, the internet interfaces, internet facing interfaces, the one interfaces are also included. I choose not to, uh, well, we're not going, going to go in that discussion now. It depends on which case for which case. If we look at the SD branch setup, we add our members. And the cool thing about 644 is that we can have so multiple SD1 zones, which is a feature that many have been waiting for. We define the different uh, S, uh, service level agreement uh, checks that we can do, and then we build these uh, SD1 rules. Okay, so how does such a rule look like? I'll just open an existing one. Uh, forget the name; it's like it's not it's not the right name. Uh, so source address is like zero zero. I, I just do everything. Like, this is nothing you should do in production. It's just like for the sake of this demo currently. Um, <clears throat> to the corporate LAN addresses, okay? So these are the IP ranges behind the tunnels. And again, we have like, we have four different paths based on the, you remember, it's like four options to any destination. So how are we going to decide? Well, this is, this is, it. this is, a policy-based route, and I'm not going to go into the details as how it's working, but it's using policy-based routes that are being dynamically added based on the SLA that is 
not met or is met. Okay. And we're doing the health checks over these two links. I simplified it a little bit. I'm not using the second data center because then the flows are for the sake of the presentation. Let's say it like that. Um, so we're going to choose one of these links. Okay. Now, it can be a manual action. You can choose for the best quality action or use all of the links together. Do some load balancing, etc. etc. So that is, this is the rule. Okay. What else? Um, yeah, so this actually allows us that um, the branches we are we are having, and, and, I, and I, have a, I have a client behind this branch. It's like it's this client, and it's running in Azure. By the way, everything is uh, everything of this part of the lab is running in Azure. If you're interested in automating that, it's fully automated as well. Um, so let's quickly go there, CMD. I So if I want to go to the for the office, that's working perfectly. Okay, so and it's going to go over all of these um, tunnels. It's not making an auto discovery VPN now. Okay, that's something else. <coughs> That is because this rule is there and a specific path is going to be chosen. Now, another rule I have made um, is like, is this, this is a specific one, it's Google ICMP. So if I, if I ping Google, it's a basic example. I want that this traffic is not going to have a local breakout on the branch, but it needs to go into the tunnel to the data center, and in this case, it's uh, one of the two data centers, but it can also be only one, so you can force it in one direction, and it is going to break out there. Now, you could ask yourself, why on earth do you want to do something like that? This is maybe because some branches for business critical SaaS applications have dynamic IP addresses, um, it's less controllable, and hence, you, you want to make sure that for these outgoing connections, that it, it, it comes from your data center. Maybe on that level, you have more strict firewall rules, more control, uh, other appliances to do security inspection. So there are definitely reasons in, in many organizations that certain flows, you want to force them over the data center, but not everything. If people are watching YouTube videos, uh, nobody cares, okay? It's a local breakout. So this is, this is a way of achieving that. Now, if you go and look at, these, at this rule, there is something interesting, a uh, difference between the previous rule. We, for a destination, we are not specifying an address, but an internet service, okay? So um, what is an internet service? An interesting question. I can I can better show that from the GUI of the FortiGate where this is actually being applied. So we can go to the GUI. Uh, so I'm on a branch one. I'm going to go to policies and objects. I'm going to go to fire policy. So again, all of the policies we've seen in the manager they've been pushed on here, and I'm actually seeing branch two. No, I'm not going to go to the firewall policy. Sorry, sorry. I need to be in the SD1 rules. So in the rule, we see the other rules we've defined. Interestingly, here you see which one is selected. Okay, so because of the SLA, we've selected the internet connection um, ISP1 to DC1. Okay, that's one which, which we have chosen. Okay. Um, and a destination is a internet service object. And as, as you see, this is a normal object as destination. So that's just a subnet. This is something we've manually created. This is something which is dynamically updated from FortiGuard. Okay. Um, Google DNS has a total of IP ranges of 55,348. Okay. 
Um, and in, in total, 10 million IP addresses. So imagine you going and update that yourself, and you can actually go and look at these um, as well. Okay. So, a better example would probably be that Office 365 traffic is being is going over a, specific, a different path, and again, you would want to include in here a the, the Office 365 you see for all of these SaaS services. We have Internet services objects, okay? So I could easily add this one, for example. Okay, close. It's going to be puking, it's going to be out of sync. Never do this in production. Once you go with the manager, keep with the manager, but for the sake of the demo and, and the GUI in the 48 is sometimes a little bit uh, better, um, I would I show it like this. So the total, so just for Office 365, total of IP addresses uh, about 700,000. So that is really huge. And it's continuously updated because these SaaS applications, they're running in the cloud, if they need more resources, they're spinning up more servers more IP addresses, more FQDNs, it's impossible to keep track of that manually. And you could then argue, well, we do application inspection, good luck with that, you need to do SSL decryption, it's not always working, but the tuple of source, destination IP, and ports, that is always correct. Okay? That cannot be encrypted, that's, that's the IP protocol. Okay, so a last thing, I. I quickly want to show you, and uh, I think it's, I think we were, we can wrap up uh, the whole thing. Um, is this auto discovery VPN thingy? Okay, so we are sitting on branch one. Okay, let's see. I hope there are no tunnels between the other sites. From a networking point of view, um, yeah, we see that there are different um, different tunnels here. Okay. And the basic tunnels that we are starting off with is like uh, are these tunnels. Now, the moment two spokes are going to communicate with each other, um, something which we call an auto discovery VPN is going to be created. Okay. So quickly check 230 and 205. We're going to go to virtual chains. So this is the this is the part of the office running in Azure. Um, just want to make sure I don't know these IP addresses by heart. So remember this. So the public IP address of the second branch ends with 49. Okay. So we are not seeing a VPN connection to the destination with 49. We agree. Uh, from a network point of view, the port which we are going to ping is on branch two, the internal interface. So the way I built this and the way in most organizations if they're thinking about such a setup is doing is it should make sense like the IP numbering. So 10.1 is branch one, 10.2 is branch two. So I'm going to ping to 10.2.2.4. We'll see what happens. Also, nice thing is that for is like this, these CLI consoles. So something I can have multiple CLI consoles. Ooh. So ping 10 to 4. But something interesting happened. Um, maybe somebody can tell me, um, but I'm, I'll tell you anyway. So what happened here is DTL is 254, and then the second ping is 255. What happened in hell? So it means there was a hop that is not there anymore all of a sudden. Well, that is the auto discovery VPN kicking in because there was a communication channel established between branch one and branch two over the hub. But we don't want that because it's like latency with latency. With, so with the auto discovery configuration, we have decided branch one and branch two can negotiate security associations with each other. Establishing a tunnel, and there is only yeah, the latency between these sites. So interestingly, we, again we see this because of DTL uh, 
diminishing or going up, whatever you want. So if we go to the network and we look at the IPsec tunnels, it's now 49. It's another tunnel. Forty-two, maybe it's. Oh yeah, there are multiple public IP addresses. No, we got to go there. Branch two. Yeah, we're not doing it on that IP address. Where the hell is it? Okay, I don't think it matters. Okay, one of these tunnels are going to that side and is based on these IP addresses. Um, you've seen it happening. The fact is here. Okay, this cannot happen without a direct connection being established immediately. I have no time to dive into details in how the configuration was working exactly, um, all of the tweaks and tricks we have done. Um, to make it work in the fashion that we desired for our use case and again tweaks that you can do to make it work differently uh, for your organization again all organizations are differently but one thing i can assure you if you build it properly using the farty manager with these scripts the setup of adding sites it's it's very very um, very easy okay and it's a very powerful feature um, of the whole security fabric Automatically, these branches have scripts in here to add them to the security fabric because of what Yes has said. This guy is the root. So I add a new site. That site builds the VPN connections automatically. It can reach the root for the key. It's attaching itself into the security fabric. And because of that, it is automatically inheriting the 40 analyzer settings, EMS settings for the sandbox settings. Um, yeah, for the manager, it's already there. Okay, and that is all happening out of the box. And then the automation, as we have seen, a basic automation on the single office is all of a sudden extended to all of these branch sites. That is really good. Unless there are um, other questions, I think we have covered what we wanted to talk about today from a technical point of view. Um, and as I've said, stay tuned. Um, we will go into Office 365. Uh, we will make it because now we do not have a domain. We will have a domain soon. It will be a hybrid setup. Um, and with that, we will have mailboxes and we will, of course, go and integrate the fourth email. Um, 40 mail in combination with the sandbox, which is already in place. And then we are going to play a little bit with, with malware and what we are seeing on that level um, in the analyzer and how, how, how the whole system can then again communicate these, uh, these things uh, with different components like the EMS. Okay. So I'm going to stop because I can keep going on. Thanks you. Thank you guys. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Are there any remarks? Any ideas? Any for ideas the for the next session? Well, but nobody can talk. Uh, there is a hand. Maxim is. I don't know. I'll unmute you, Maxim. Yeah, you can speak. Uh, English or Netherlands or? I don't know. I think. So, do it in English. I do it in, I, okay, I, I will. Um, I will next week. I will have a four-day course. Is it given by you uh, for Fortinet or not? It will be yes. It, it, ah, okay, 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 nice. And um, it's about. Is it about this lesson or is it completely different? Or can you tell me something about it or? Yeah, so it's the, it's the NSD4 course. It will be, so NSD4 is all about the 40 gate. So okay. you will learn, you will learn how, how, basically how to configure all of these things. You are, I'm not, you're still seeing my screen. Huh? So mm -hmm. you will be learning, I think it's a basic security fabric maybe you're going to build, but it's mainly going to be focused on how the network and the routing uh, system settings, how to build policies and objects. Um, you see there's a lot of objects, so the relationship between these objects and the viral policies, routing, yes. you're going to see all of that. And 
Um, the next step is actually the NSC 7 training. This is where we are going to go to managing these things from a foreign management point of view uh, and also troubleshooting. We are going to build, at the end of that training, you have built like an EGPT setup, very similar to what I have shown in, um, in my presentation. But yeah. Yeah. What we have shown now is a combination of a lot of components. So EMS is a different training, 40 Sandbox is a different training, 40 Mail, so there, there is a lot in here which we brought together. But to answer short, next week is the, is the start. You, you need that as a starting Okay, that's clear for me. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, uh, to next week then, and I will uh, have the link on my email. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.